When I think about gifts, it reminds me of a story I once read about a dad. A dad's birthday. And shortly before his birthday, his family went to him and said, Dad, what would you like for a gift? And he thought about that for a while, and then he said, well, I really don't need anything. And there's nothing that I really want. So he suggested to his family that they get him a gift that the whole family could get something out of it. And so they did. And when Dad's birthday arrived and he opened up his present, there he found a brand new wallet. So if you are a dad that puts money in your wallet for your family members to take it out of your wallet, be careful what you ask for. <laughs> Most people enjoy receiving and opening gifts. For some people, the most memorable and exciting times of their lives is when they receive a special gift from a special person on a special occasion, and it created precious moments that lasted a lifetime. Most of us can remember the excitement and anticipation as we gathered around the Christmas tree, waiting for the time that we were allowed to open those gifts. When parents give children a gift, they not only like to give the gift, they like to see the child open the gift. Because this is when both the giver and receiver are blessed. So it would be very unusual if a child did not open a gift. In fact, it would be unusual for most of us if we didn't open a gift. But if the child did not open the gift, more than that, the parent would likely be very disappointed. As was read in the scripture this morning, God gives his children spiritual gifts. Each child of God is given at least one gift as part of the plan God has for giving us abundant life and a better world. And so the Bible tells us that God gives us good gifts for our benefit, for the blessing of others, and these are gifts from God. And yet sometimes, they are left unopened. And it, and it begs the question, why would a gift from God be left unopened? To help answer the question, we could take a look at four steps that are involved in receiving and using spiritual gifts. The first step involves knowing that you have a gift. Because if you don't know you have a gift, then obviously you're not able to open something you're unaware of. And that is why it is so important to open and study the Word of God, because this is where we gain knowledge and insight that helps us understand many things in life. And also, spiritual gifts. As the uh, seventh verse that was read says, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for good works. So we know that there is a purpose for the spiritual gifts that we are given, and if they are left unopened, then there's no way to take advantage of what we have been given. However, when we do open that gift, that is when blessings can occur. And notice in that seventh verse, it doesn't say a couple, or some, or even many receive spiritual gifts. All, each and every child of God receives a spiritual gift. So if you're here today and you're a child of God, you have been given a spiritual gift. However, you may not know what it is. 
And that leads us to the second step. Discovering the gift that God has given us. Fortunately, there are ways that we can go about discovering those gifts. Gifts that include things like encouragement and compassion, pastoring and teaching, wisdom, giving, and evangelism. The first thing we can do is go to God in prayer and ask him for guidance in leading us to an understanding of what our gift is. There are also spiritual gift assessments that are available and you can participate in those and it helps focus you in areas where it is most likely that your spiritual gift resides. And then there's always the option of asking other Christians, what do they see as your spiritual gift? Because oftentimes others can see in you what you cannot see in yourself. When we discover the spiritual gift, it's kind of like opening the present, because now we know what we have. And that leads us to the next step, and that is understanding the purpose of the spiritual gift. And herein lies a potential obstacle. Even though we know what the gift is, we may not know what it's for. And that can cause us to stop. It reminds me of the very first time I held my first child. And I looked at her And I knew I was looking at an amazing gift. But I didn't know what to do with it. And so it is with spiritual gifts. And to help prevent that from happening, as with many things in life, we can go to Scripture to get answers and insight. In Ephesians 4, verse 12, it says, Spiritual gifts are given to equip the saints for the work of the ministry to build up the body of Christ. And then, similarly, in 1 Corinthians 14, 12, it says, So with yourselves, being eager for spiritual gifts, strive to excel in them to build up the body of the church. Well, the body of Christ and the body of the church are one and the same, since the church is the body of Christ. And any time the church is built up and a name is added to the book of life, the church grows. So, now we have an idea of the purpose of the gift, and we can begin to think about, well, how could we use that? What could we do to make a difference for God using our spiritual gift? And so as we think about that, we're now in step four, and that is actually putting the gift to use. And here we might run into another obstacle before we actually put it in use. And it's caused by fear and doubt. It comes in the form of questions. What if I'm not good at utilizing my gift? Hmm. What if I start to utilize my gift? Then what's going to be expected of me? And what if I continue to use that gift? Where will it lead me? Understandable questions. But when you have questions and reservations, you will find yourself in good company. When Moses called God, or God called Moses, to lead the people out of Egypt, Moses was reluctant. He had questions. He had concerns. When Gideon was called to free his people 
from the Midianites, he was unsure of his ability to accomplish that task. And then there's Jonah. When he was called to go to Nineveh, he went in the complete opposite direction. So you can see that having questions and concerns is understandable. And once again, we will return to Scripture to help us understand what we can do about that. And this is in Ephesians 2.10. And it says, For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Well, there are, that, that, by the way, that God had prepared in it beforehand to be our way of life. So when we look at that verse, there are three essential elements that we find there that speak directly to those questions and concerns that we had. The first is, he has made us what we are. He has made us what we are. He has put us here, and he is able to give us what we, are need, what we need to have to put our spiritual gift into use. We don't need to wait until we join a church or, or lead a Bible study or serve on a committee. We are intended to do good works. And the spiritual gifts, using the spiritual gifts, is one of the ways in which we do good works and build up the church. And then it says that God beforehand, in advance, in advance of you ever being given a spiritual gift, God has already prepared you to be able to use that gift. Why would God say, this is the way of life that I have prepared for you, and then not give you what you need for the spiritual gift? So now, everything's in place. We know we have a gift. We've discovered what it is. We know what it's to be used for. And we have confidence and reassurance that we can actually be effective in using that gift. Knowing that spiritual gifts are for building up the church is important. But seeing those gifts in action really help us understand. How does church growth really occur when people use their spiritual gifts? In 1 uh, Corinthians 12, verses 12 to 27, Paul talks about an analogy between the body of Christ and the human body. And he talks about in the physical body, there are many parts that need to work together to make something happen. And so it is with the church. We need everybody using their spiritual gift in order for the church to accomplish all that they can. So, let's take a quick look at an example. There's a church, and in that church, there's a person that has the gift of giving. And so what that person does is gathers up all the financial resources needed for an outreach ministry that the church would like to do. Once that's all in place, there's another member of that church with the gift of leadership. They step forward, they organize the event. The event is focused on inviting people in the local community to come into the church, and there's a meal. So the fact that there's a meal, we now know this is a Methodist church. Shortly before the event is to occur, there's a member that has the gift of assisting. That person cleans the kitchen, and helps prepare the meal. On the day of the event, the guests come in, and there is a member that has the gift of evangelism. And they're sitting at a table next to a guest. They welcome the guest. They introduce them to the good news. And then they invite them to a Sunday worship service. The guest shows up one Sunday, and they're greeted by a minister with the gift of pastoring and make them feel welcome. The same minister during the sermon with the gift of teaching speaks to that person in a special way. At the end of the service, there's a person with the gift of encouragement. 
they introduce that guest to other members of the church. They invite that guest to participate in the weekly activities of the church so that Sunday is not an ending, but it is the beginning of a journey that leads that guest to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what building up the church, that's what building up the body of Christ is really all about. When that happens, the church will grow, it will stay alive. It requires every member, because if one gift is missing, then the other gifts, their impact is weakened. And those others need to work harder. But when everybody in a church is using their spiritual gifts, the power of the Holy Spirit will touch lives in ways you cannot imagine. To bring it a little bit closer to home, most of us can remember someone that used their spiritual gift in our faith journey. It could be that person that was a word of encouragement when we needed, came alongside of us, showed compassion when we were walking through a valley. Uh, maybe it was, like the church. It was a minister, a pastor that said something that made a real difference to us. Could have been somebody with wisdom. We were struggling with something, and somebody comes along, and they have this gift of wisdom, and they, and they show us a solution that we never could come up with on our own. Or maybe it was the person on the other end of a prayer line when you dialed that number in the midst of despair. All of these people were using the gifts that they were given to bless others and more importantly to carry out the plan that God has intended. Most of the spiritual gifts, sorry, most of the material gifts that I've received over the years are worn out, given away, or thrown away. But spiritual gifts, they are intended to last a lifetime and beyond. They involve the giver, the Holy Spirit, the receiver, the child of God, and then the person that is to be blessed by that gift. So only one question remains. What will you do with what God has given you? Someone is waiting to be blessed by your gift. Will you do for them what someone did for you?